Three years have passed since we were last with the March girls. War is now over, and the women are overjoyed to have their men safely at home. Brooke did his duty manfully for a year, got wounded, was sent home, and not allowed to return. To please grandfather, I went to college, and am now getting through it in the easiest possible manner to please myself. Mrs. March is as brisk and cheery as ever, and just now so absorbed in Meg's wedding preparations. Meg, dear, come see, come see. The roses are about to bloom. They will look perfect in your hair for your special day. Oh, and in your bouquet and on your dress. Heavens, I hope they'll be enough. There are enough here for a dozen weddings. <laughs> John's favorite flower is lily of the valley, and that is all I shall have in my bouquet. Now, I must check with Hannah if she has got everything in for the lunch. I don't want all left to the last minute and then find it's out of stock. I can get everything she needs, Marmy. I quite fancy a walk into town. Well, I'm off to Aunt March's now, Marmy. Oh, wish her well, Amy, and double check she knows the time of the wedding. <laughs> Adieu. Adieu. Goodbye. Goodbye. Joe never went back to Aunt March, for the old lady took such a fancy to Amy that she bribed her with the offer of drawing lessons from one of the best teachers going if she would continue to visit. Joe, meantime, devotes herself to literature, and to Beth, who remains delicate, long after the fever was a thing of the past. Aunt March quietly accepted that Meg and John's wedding would go ahead and had made a marked and generous supply of house and table linen as her wedding present to the young couple. Marmy and the girls spend most of their time at Meg and John's little home, which I christened Dovecote, a fitting name for the lovebirds. This is quite lovely. Are you satisfied, my dear girl? Does it seem like home to you? And do you feel as if you should be happy here? Yes, mother, perfectly satisfied, thanks to you all. I couldn't have done it without you. There may be no marble top tables, long mirrors, or lace curtains, but there are pretty gifts all about which came from your friendly hands. Oh. If only you had a servant oh, or two, it would be all right. Dear. Marmy and I have talked that over, Amy. And I have made up my mind to try her way first. I have Lottie to run my errands and help me here and there. I shall only have enough work to keep me from getting lazy or homesick. <sighs> Sally Moffat has four servants. If Meg had four, the house wouldn't hold them. And Master and Mrs. would have to camp in the garden. <laughs> Sally isn't a poor man's wife. And many maids are in keeping with her fine establishment. Meg and John begin humbly... But I have a feeling that there will be quite as much happiness in the little house as in the big one. Quite right. <laughs> it's a great mistake for young ladies like Meg to leave themselves nothing to do but dress, give orders, and gossip. Well said, Mother. <laughs> oh, 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 Laurie, you're home. How good to see you. How are we? Keeping out of trouble, I hope. Yes, I am. Glad to hear it. <laughs> Is that a fitting welcome for your boy? Don't tease. Come here. <laughs> oh, welcome home, Teddy. How is college? What's the news? Walk with me. I'll tell you all. Marmy, I'm going for a stroll with Teddy. It has been too long and we must catch up. <sighs> Dearest Meg, I love your house. It feels like you. Beautiful and homely. Thank you. I hope you will always visit. You can count on it. Teddy and I walked the short way back home. Arms linked, carefree. His weekly visit home was an important event in my quiet life. <laughs> now, Teddy, I want to talk seriously to you about tomorrow. You must promise me to behave well and not cut up any pranks or spoil our plans for the wedding. Not a prank. And don't say funny things when we ought to be sober. I never do. You're the one for that. And I implore you not to look at me during the ceremony. <laughs> I shall certainly laugh if you do. You won't see me. You'll be crying so hard that the thick fog around you will obscure the prospect. I never cry unless for some great affliction. Oh, such as old fellows going off to college, eh? Don't be a peacock. <laughs> I only moaned a trifle to keep the girls company. I won't cry. I have accepted John and love him as dearly as I can. Mm. Though I don't want anyone else in this family getting married for years to come. You'll go next. we all be left lamenting. Me? Don't be absurd. I'm not of the agreeable sort. Nobody will want me. And it's a mercy, for there should always be one old maid in the family. Mm. You won't give anyone a chance. You won't show the soft side of your character, and if a fellow gets a look by accident and can't help showing that he likes it, you get so thorny that no one dares touch or look at you. I don't like that sort of thing. 
I'm too busy to be worried with nonsense. And I think it's dreadful to break up families, so... Now, don't say any more about it. Meg's wedding has turned all our heads, and we talk of nothing but lovers and such absurdities. <laughs> Meg didn't want a fashionable wedding, but only those about her whom she loved. There was to be no silk, lace, or orange flowers. Instead, she made her wedding gown herself, sewing into it the tender hopes and romances of a girlish heart. All three sisters wore suits of thin, silvery gray silk, with blush roses in their hair, fresh from the garden. Everything was to be as natural and homelike as possible, which scandalized Aunt March when she arrived with Aunt Carol and Cousin Flo. <laughs> Upon my word, here's a state of things. You oughtn't to be seen until the last minute, child. I'm not a show aunt, and no one is coming to stare at me to criticize my dress or count the cost of my luncheon. <laughs> I'm too happy to care what anyone <laughs> says or thinks, and I'm going to have my little wedding just as I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do look just like our own dear Meg, only so very sweet and lovely that I should hug you if it wouldn't crumple your dress. <laughs> Then I'm satisfied, Amy, but please <laughs> hug and kiss me, everyone. <laughs> and I don't mind my dress. I want a great many crumples of this sort into it today. <laughs> there was to be no bridal procession, but a sudden silence fell upon the room as Mr. March and the young pair took their places. Dearly beloved, family and friends. Mr. March's voice broke more than once, which only seemed to make the service more... Beautiful. And Brooke's hand visibly trembled, and no one could hear his replies. Meg looked straight into her husband's eyes and said, I will, with such tender trust that even Aunt March sniffed audibly. Joe did not cry, though she was very near at once, I dare say. Joe's angles are much softened, and she has learned to carry herself with ease. The curly crop is lengthened into a thick coil. And there is a fresh color in her cheeks, a soft shine in her eyes, and generally, only gentle words fall from her sharp tongue these days. I kept my eyes fixed on her throughout. After lunch, people strolled about by twos and threes, through the house and garden, enjoying the sunshine. I wish you well, my dear. I heartily wish you well. But I think you'll be sorry for it. You've got a treasure, young man. See that you deserve it. I certainly will. And. <laughs> <laughs> oh, John, dear. We must speak to Mr. Lawrence before we go. This is the prettiest wedding I've ever seen. But I don't see why. But there wasn't a bit of style about it. Amy, don't say such a thing. I wouldn't dream of having a wedding like this, Joe. With no guests and no champagne. <laughs> well, you are not Meg. It suits her perfectly, and I like it. <laughs> My dear family, <laughs> don't feel that I am separated from you or that I love you any less for loving John so much. <laughs> I shall come every day and expect to keep my old place in all your hearts, though I am married. <laughs> Thank you all for my happy wedding day. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Oh, my family gathered about me to say goodbye, and then John and I took the short walk from my old home to new to begin our married life. John, I need you to order a dozen or so little pots and extra sugar. Our currants are ripe, and I'm going to make red currant jelly with them. Anything for my wife. I am rather partial to currant jelly, so cannot wait to try it. Goodbye, my dear. Goodbye. John sent home four dozen delightful little pots, half a barrel of sugar, and a small boy to pick the currants for me. I did my best. I spent the day picking, boiling, straining, and fussing over the jelly. I racked my brain to remember what Hannah did that I had left undone and then reboiled, resugared, and restrained, but that dreadful stuff just wouldn't gel. I sat down in the topsy turvy kitchen and wept. <laughs> my dear girl, what is the matter? Oh, John, I am so tired and hot and cross and worried. I've been at it till I'm worn out. What worries you, dear? Has anything dreadful happened? Yes. Tell me quick, then. Don't cry. I can bear anything better than that. How was it, my love? The jelly won't gel, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> Is 
at all? <laughs> Fling it out of the window and don't bother any more about it. I'll buy you quartz if you want it, but for heaven's sake, don't have hysterics, for I bought Jack Scott home to dinner. A man to dinner and everything in a mess. John Brooke! How could you do such a thing? I forgot the confounded jelly, but it can't be helped No, now. you ought to have sent word or told me this morning, and you ought to have remembered how busy I was. I didn't know this morning, and there was no time to send word, for I met him on the way out. I never thought of asking leave when you have always told me to do as I liked. I never tried it before, and, and hang me if I ever do it again. Oh, no, take him away at once. I can't see him, and there isn't any dinner. It's a scrape, <laughs> I acknowledge, but if you lend a hand, we'll pull through and have a good time yet. Don't cry, dear, but just exert yourself a bit and knock us up something to eat. Give us the cold meat, bread, and cheese. We won't ask for any jelly. You must get yourself out of the scrape as you can. I'm too used up to exert myself for anyone. It's like a man to propose a bone and vulgar bread and cheese for company. I won't have anything of the sort in my house. Take that Scott up to Mother's and tell him I'm away. Or sick. Or dead. Anything, but I won't see him. And you two can laugh at me and my jelly as much as you like, for you won't have anything else here. Meg, wait now. Dearest, please. I longed to go to Mother and share with her how cruel John had been to me, but I didn't. Nobody will know. But I did desert him in hour of need, and I made Mr. Scott and John very unwelcome. I heard much laughter and chatter downstairs as I hid away, ashamed of my behavior in our bedroom. Then they went out, and John did not return for many hours. Oh, dear. Married life is very trying and does need infinite patience as well as love. John is a good man, but he has his faults, and I must learn to see and bear them whilst trying to remember my own. So I shall dress myself prettily, sit down, and sew as I wait patiently for John to return. Good evening. Now... I shall be the first to say, forgive me, but he does not seem to hear me. It was wrong of me to laugh at the jelly pots. Forgive me, dear. I never will again. But he did, hundreds of times, and so did I. The year rolled round with its marital ups and downs along the way, and in midsummer there came to me the deepest and tenderest experience of a woman's life. <laughs> Why, Jupiter, twins, what fun. What are you going to name them? Are they boys? A boy and girl. Oh, Beth, aren't they beautiful? <laughs> Most remarkable children I ever saw. <laughs> which one's which? Amy put a blue ribbon on the boy and a pink on the girl. French fashion, so you can always tell them apart. <laughs> Kiss them, Uncle Teddy. Oh, I'm afraid they might like it. <laughs> of course they will. Do it now. <laughs> there. I knew they would like it. <laughs> what are their names? Meg says he's to be called John Lawrence and the girl Margaret after mother and grandmother. <laughs> we shall call her Daisy so as not to have two Megs. And I suppose Manny will be called Jack unless we find a better name. Name him Demi John and call him Demi for short. Oh, <laughs> Daisy and Demi. Just the thing. I knew Teddy would do it. Oh. <laughs> Lori certainly had done it that time, and the babies were known as Daisy and Demi from there on. And very soon, our little dove coat became a real home, and it was all I wanted. We fell into a pattern of things. Meg was busy with her babies, with Marmy as a gentle help whenever she needed it, Joe was making herself a small but independent living, writing stories for the paper. And Beth was busy about the house with the quiet duty she loved, everyone's friend. And I visited Aunt March daily and devoted all my spare time to my art. And all the while I was learning, doing, and enjoying other things. For I had resolved to be an attractive and accomplished woman, even if I would never become a great artist. Come, Joe, it's time. For what? You don't mean to say you've forgotten that you promised to make half a dozen calls with me today. Amy, I've done a good many rash and foolish things in my life, but I don't think I ever was mad enough to say I'd make six calls in one day when a single one upsets me for a week. Yes, you did. You promised, and you pride yourself on keeping promises. So be honorable, come and do your duty, and then be at peace for another six months. Well, I'll go if I must and do my best. 
You shall be commander of the exhibition and I'll obey blindly. Does that satisfy you? <laughs> You're a perfect cherub. I'll tell you how to behave at each place so that you'll make a good impression. I want people to like you. And they would if only you try to be a little more agreeable. Do your hair the pretty way and put a pink rose in your bonnet. It's becoming. <laughs> there. <sighs> You're highly satisfactory. Turn slowly round and let me get a careful view. I'm perfectly miserable. But if you consider me presentable, I die happy. <laughs> yes, you'll do. And so began our day of house calls. Now, Joe, dear, the Chesters are very elegant people. So I want you to put on your best deportment. Just be calm, cool, and quiet. That's safe and ladylike, and you can easily do it for 15 minutes. Hmm, let me see. Calm, cool, and quiet. Yes, I think I can manage that. But of course, Joe took me at my word, and during the first call, sat with every limb gracefully composed, and was as silent as a sphinx. In vain, Mrs. Chester alluded to Joe's charming novel, and the Mrs. Chesters spoke of parties, picnics, the opera, and fashions, and each and all were answered by a smile, a bow, and a demure, yes, or no, with the chill on. I poked her with my foot to try to draw her out, no. but Joe sat as if unconscious of it all. How could you mistake me so? I merely meant you to be properly dignified and composed. Oh, try to be sociable at the lambs, gossip as other girls do, and, and be interested in dress and flirtations and whatever nonsense comes up. I'll be agreeable. I'll gossip and giggle and have horrors and raptures over any trifle you like. <laughs> I rather enjoy all this. When Joe turns freakish, there's no knowing what she might do. And I anxiously watched as she skimmed into the drawing room, kissed all the young ladies with effusion, and beamed graciously upon the young gentlemen, and joined in with the chat with such spirit I hardly recognized her. There's nothing that child cannot do. <laughs> what possessed you to tell those stories about the hats and boots and all that stuff? It's funny, and it amuses people. <sighs> They know we are poor, so it's no use pretending that we buy three or four hats a season or new shoes for every party and have things as fine and easy as they do. You never will learn when to hold your tongue and when to speak. Let us go home now, then. And never mind Aunt March today. Aunt likes to have us pay her the compliment of coming in style and making a formal call. It's a little thing to do, but it gives her pleasure. What a good girl you are, Amy. I wish it was as easy for me to do little things to please people as it is for you. Women should learn to be agreeable, particularly poor ones, for they have no other way of repaying the kindness they receive. And on we walked to Aunt March's. Now tell me, Amy, how is your French coming on, my dear? Très bien, Tante March. Oh, c'est bon. <laughs> That's good to hear. And you, Josephine? Uh. I can't bear French. It's such a slippery, silly sort of language. <clears throat> Are you going to help at the fair, Amy? Uh, yes, Aunt. Mrs. Chester asked me if I would, oh. and I offered to tend a table, as I have nothing but my time to give. Oh. <laughs> I'm not. I hate to be patronized, and the Chesters think it's a great favor to allow us to help with their highly connected fair. I wonder you consented, Amy. They only want you to work. And I am willing to work. It's for the freedmen as well as the Chesters, and I think it's very kind of them to let me share their labor and fun. <laughs> Patronage don't trouble me when it's well meant. Quite right and proper. I like your grateful spirit, my dear. Yeah, it's a pleasure to help people who appreciate our efforts. Some don't, and that is trying. A week later, Mother receives a letter from Aunt March, saying that Aunt Carol is going abroad next month and wants me to go with her as a companion for her daughter, Flo. Joe is red with rage and feels she should have been picked instead of me. Oh, Mother, she's too young. It's my turn first, and I've wanted to go for so long. I'm afraid it's impossible, Joe. Aunt March says it's to be Amy decidedly. It's always so. Amy has all the fun, and I have all the work. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. I I'm afraid it's partly your own fault, dear. She planned to ask you first, but as you hate French, she writes, I won't venture to invite her. Oh, my tongue. My abominable tongue. 
Why can't I learn to keep it quiet? I wish you could have gone. But there is no hope of it this time. Try to bear it cheerfully. And don't sadden Amy's pleasure by reproaches or regrets. I'll try. There was not much time for preparation, and the house was a flurry of activity as everyone helped me pack until the day I was ready to depart. Goodbye! Goodbye, Marmy! I will write, I promise! I bore up stoutly saying goodbye, and then just as the gangway was about to be withdrawn, it suddenly came over me. That whole ocean was soon to roll between me and the ones who loved me best, and I clung to Lori, the last to linger. Oh, do take care of him for me. And if anything should happen... I will, dear. Time to depart. Vacate the gangway, please. So Amy sailed away to find the old world, which is always new and beautiful to young eyes. This had always been my dream, and though I bore up well when we waved her off at the quayside, when we got home, I retired to my refuge up here in the garret and cried till I couldn't cry anymore. I have a new letter from our young explorer. I have been longing to hear from her. Beth, dear, would you like to read it? Oh, Joe reads aloud better than I. Go ahead. I like to listen. Oh. Dearest people, here I really sit at a front window of the Bath Hotel Piccadilly London. <laughs> oh, I can't begin to tell you how I am enjoying it all. I sent a line from Halifax when I was feeling pretty miserable. Oh, oh my little baby, I was worried she'd get homesick. If I know Amy, I bet it passes soon enough. Oh, it does, it does. She writes, after that I got on delightfully, seldom ill, on deck all day with plenty of pleasant people to amuse me. <laughs> Everyone was very kind to me, especially the officers. <laughs> That's just like Amy, straight to the top. <laughs> and she writes, don't laugh, Joe. Gentlemen really are very necessary aboard ship <laughs> to hold on to or wait upon one. It's a mercy to make them useful, otherwise they would smoke to death, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Aunt Carol and Flo were poorly all the way and liked to be left alone. Oh. Oh, so when I had done what I could for them, I went and enjoyed myself. Such walks on deck, such sunsets, such splendid air and waves. I wish Beth could have come. Mm -hmm. It would have done her so much good. Oh, that's so sweet of her to think of me. I'll take you to the seashore, Bethy. See that I don't. Oh, you're here too, Joe. As for Joe, she would have made friends with all the engineers <laughs> and have tooted on the captain's speaking trumpet. She'd have been in such a state of rapture. <laughs> She's right, of course. I'd have no time for holding on to the office. No. <laughs> Amy says she will write to us again soon. It rained when we got to London, and there was nothing to be seen but fog and umbrellas. And so we rested, unpacked, and shopped a little between the showers. I have met a very nice family who, would you believe it, no Lori. How small the world seems, even though I'm so far from you all. Fred, who is the eldest, is very charming. And his young brother Frank, a shy, rosy-faced boy, who reminds me a little of dear Beth. I really feel like a dissipated London fine lady, writing here so late, with my room full of pretty things and my head a jumble of parks, theaters, new gowns. <laughs> Anyways, Aunt is tapping on the wall for a third time, so I must stop. I'm so looking forward to Paris, but I long to see you all, and in spite of my nonsense, I am, as ever, your loving Amy. Such delightful times we are having in Paris. Fred Vaughn is often my companion, for he has turned up again on his way to Switzerland. Aunt looked a little sober at first, but as he speaks French like a native, we are now all very glad he came and are grateful to have Fred do the parlez vousing as Uncle calls it. This is a splendid location. I take my hat off to you, madame, were I wearing one, for finding such an ideal spot to simply watch the wonderful Parisian world go by. N'est-ce pas? Thank you, Fred. I'm glad it pleases you. Oui, madame. Il est parfait. So, mademoiselle Amy, what will we do tomorrow? Uh, rain is forecast. Then to the Louvre, perhaps? I cannot think of a better place to be on a rainy day in Paris. Nor I. May I accompany you, mon ami? Uh, of course. Yes, I think we shall all come. 
I am so happy. Sometimes I think I will burst with excitement and the wonder of it all. Robert, dear, I, I have a letter here from Amy. Well, shall we wait and read it with Joe and Beth? Not this one. She's written it privately for just my eyes, but you need to hear it too. All right. My dear Marmy, I'll try I'll to try tell, to you, tell, what tell you what has happened, what has happened for, some for some of it, it is very important, as you will see. Fred has been so kind and jolly that we have all grown quite fond of him. I never thought anything but a traveling friendship, but I've begun to feel that the moonlight walks, balcony talks, and daily adventures are something more to him than fun. I haven't flirted, Mother, truly, but remembered what you said to me and have done my very best. I can't help it if people like me. I don't try to make them, and it worries me if I don't care for them. Marmy, I've made up my mind, and if Fred asks me, I shall accept him, though I'm not madly in love. Mm. I like him, and we get on comfortably together. He is handsome, young, clever enough, and very rich. Ever so much richer than the Lawrences. Oh, well, that's something. One of us must marry well. Meg didn't. Joe won't. Beth can't yet. So I shall, and make everything cozy all round. I hate poverty and don't mean to bear it a minute longer than I can help. Oh, Amy. When will she learn that though money is a precious thing, it is not the only prize to strive for? Nowhere does she write she loves him. Though Fred is not my model hero, he does very well. He does very well. And in time I should get fond enough of him... If he was very fond of me, and let me do just as I liked. Dearest Amy, you look simply stunning. Oh, thank you, Fred. All dressed up and ready for another adventure. I'm afraid I have to leave. Oh, well, whatever's the matter? My brother Frank is very ill. They're begging me to come home, so I'm leaving at once, on the night train. I only had time to find you to say goodbye, and... I shall soon come back, though. You won't forget me, Amy? Of course I won't. There was no time for anything but messages and goodbyes, for he was gone in an hour, and now we all miss him very much. I know he wanted to speak more, but we shall soon meet again in Rome, and then, if I don't change my mind, I'll say yes thank you when he says, will you please. With Amy away enjoying her life in Europe, our little house seems very quiet indeed. Until, of course, Meg and the twins arrived. And then the house feels full again, with laughter and childish pranks. How we love these visits. And I believe Beth is gaining a little of her old strength the more time she spends with Daisy and Demi. Lori comes and goes from college, and when he arrives home, he comes straight over to visit us. When he first went, he fell in love about once a month. But these small flames were brief, did no damage, and amused me no end. But then there came a time when Lori ceased to worship at many shrines, and instead hinted at one absorbing passion. Come on, Joe, don't be thorny. After studying myself to a skeleton all week, a fellow deserves some petting and ought to get it. Mother doesn't approve of flirting, even in fun. And you do flirt desperately, Teddy. God, I'd give anything if I could answer so to you. Go and sing for me, why don't you? I'm dying for some music, and I always like yours. I'd rather stay here beside you, thank you. Well, you can't. There isn't room. Besides, I thought you hated to be tied to a woman's apron string. Ah, that depends on who wears the apron. Are you going? If I must. Adieu. Adieu, dearest Joe. <sighs> Lori graduated with honor that year. We were all there. Mr. Lawrence, so proud. Marmy and Father, John and Meg, Beth and I, all exulted over him with admiration and praise and joy. Now you're graduated, you must have a good long holiday. I intend to. Will we walk? I always used to take his arm on these occasions, but now I did not. He made no complaint, which bothered me. So we walked on in silence until we came to the little path that led homeward through the grove. It's no use, Joe. We've got to have it out, and the sooner the better for both of us. Oh, Teddy, please don't. Joe, I've loved you ever since I've known you. I couldn't help it. You've been so good to me. 
I tried to show it, but you wouldn't let me. Now I'm going to make you hear and give me an answer. For I can't go on like this any longer. I wanted to save you from this. I thought you'd understand. I know you did, but girls say no when they mean yes and drive a man out of his wits for the fun of it. Not me. I never wanted to make you care for me. But I do. I'm so grateful to you and so proud and fond of you. But you and I are not suited to each other. Our quick tempers and strong wills will make us very miserable if we were so foolish as to marry? No, no, we shouldn't. We'd be happy. If you love me, Joe, I should be the perfect saint for you can make me anything you like. I, I can't say yes, truly. So I won't say it at all. Then what will become of me? You'll see that I'm right by and by and thank me for it. You'll love someone else and forget all this trouble. I can't love anyone else. And I'll never forget you, Joe. Yes, you will. You'll find some lovely, accomplished girl who will adore you and make a fine mistress for your fine house. And I, I shouldn't like elegant society, and you would, and you would hate my scribbling, and I couldn't get on without it. I don't believe I shall ever marry. I'm happy as I am, and love my liberty too well to be in any hurry to give it up for any mortal man. <laughs> I know better. You, you think so now, but there will come a time when you will care for somebody, and you'll love him, and I shall have to stand by and see it. Be hanged if I will. Where are you going? What does it matter? Wait. Wait, will you please? Teddy, oh, Teddy, I'm so desperately sorry. I've tried. I've done my best. I wish I could love you like you want me to, but I just can't. You'll be sorry someday, Joe. And with that, he turned sharply away from me and marched off through the long grass towards the riverbank. I drew a long breath and watched the poor fellow trying to outstrip the trouble which he carried in his heart. Soon after this, Laurie told me he and Mr. Lawrence were to go to Europe. Grandfather has business in London that needs looking after. He has friends in London and Paris, and he should like to visit them. Meanwhile, I can go to Italy, Germany, Switzerland, wherever I want, and enjoy pictures, music, scenery, and adventures to, to my heart's content. When do you leave? As soon as we are ready. A week or two. Maybe less. What does it matter to you? During the time leading up to their departure, Lori avoided me but I often caught him staring at me from his window with that tragic face that haunted my dreams at night and oppressed me with a heavy sense of guilt by day. What is it, my dear? Are you well? Quite well, Marmy. I just... I need something new. I brew too much over my own small affairs and need stirring up, so I'd like to take a little hop away and spread my wings. And where will you hop to? You remember your friend Mrs. Kirk wrote to you, asking for some respectable young person to teach her children and so, And I think I should suit if I tried. To New York? I long for a complete change, Marmy. But what of your writing? All the better for the change. <sighs> How are things with Laurie? Oh, Mother, I wish I felt differently. I fear I've lost his friendship forever. His wound will heal in time, I'm sure of it. But you made the wisest choice. I don't think you are suited to one another. As friends, you are very happy and your quarrels soon blow over. But I feared you would have rebelled if you had been mated for life. You were too much alike, too fond of freedom to get on happily together. How well you know me, Mother. <laughs> <laughs> would you allow me to go? Of course. I won't deny I will miss you with all my heart, but I can't keep you here. Thank you. I said nothing about my plan to spend the winter in New York to Lori, and he continued to avoid me. But I was now too busy with my own preparations to be distracted by his sorrowful face at the window. Goodbye, Laurie. Gotcha. When the day of parting came, Laurie affected high spirits, and he got on very well until Marmy kissed him with a whisper full of motherly solicitude. I followed him to his carriage. Oh, Joe, can you? Teddy, dear, I wish I could. It's all right. Never mind. Adieu. And away he went without another word. But it wasn't all right, and I did mind. I felt as if I had stabbed my dearest friend, and when he left... Without looking back, I knew that the boy, Lori, never would come again. 
I am now on my own adventures in New York City. I was so desperately sad to leave home, to say farewell to dear Bethy and mother and father. But on my journey here, the sun came out, and I took that as a good omen. May I help you with your bags, Freud? Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Oh. My, what have you in here? Books. Ah, books are good. I can manage from here. Thank you. Are you sure? Quite sure. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. I watch the gentlemen stroll off and rejoin the bustling street. I wonder if everyone I meet here will be so kind as he. The uh, nursery where you are to teach and sew with the girls is next to my private parlor. And uh, my door is always open to you. And your own shall be as comfortable as I can make it. I'm afraid the scar parlor is all I have left. Here we are then. There's a stove and a little table there by the sunny window. It's perfect for my writing. And there's a fine view of the church and tower opposite. I love it. Thank you. I learnt from Mrs. Kirk that the man with the foreign accent who helped me with my bags must have been Professor Bear, a resident of her house. He's always doing things like that. Helps the servant girl up the stairs with the coal. Very well-mannered gentleman. He was from Berlin. Very learned and good, but as poor as a church mouse. He gives lessons in my parlor to support himself and his two little orphan nephews whom he is educating here. The professor has the kindest eyes I ever saw. He has a full head of brown hair that tumbles all over his face and a bushy beard. His clothes are rusty, his hands are large, and he isn't handsome, yet I do like him. He looks like a gentleman. That's very nice, Kitty. My dear, would you like to join us for dinner this evening? Oh, yes, I, I would. Thank you very much. Professor Bear is very fond of children. All the children of the house have lost their heart to him. In fact, everyone is fond of him. It puzzles me at first. He is neither rich nor great, young nor handsome. He is poor, but always appears to be giving something away. A stranger, yet everyone is his friend. No longer young, but as happy-hearted as a boy. He makes me smile. Oh, you have a good day for your walk, Miss March. It is most pleasant out. Cold, but fresh and very bright. Makes you feel alive, no? Yes, I do hope so. Uh, will you go home for Christmas, Miss March? No, this Christmas at least I shall be here. Ah, first Christmas from home? Yes. Then we must make it special, no? Uh, oh, I, I don't need any fuss. <laughs> Right, here, let me open the door for you. Thank you, Professor. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> As Christmas approaches, I am homesick. But my exchanges with the Professor somehow make it easier to bear. A gift for you, Miss Marsh. Mr. Bear, this is very kind. Your Shakespeare book. You always say you long for a library. And now you have it, all in one book. From your friend, Friedrich Bayer. It's the perfect gift. Thank you. Not having much money or knowing what he'd like, I got several little things and put them about his room where he would find them unexpectedly. A new stand dish for his table, a little vase for his flower, as he always wears one in his buttonhole. And I wrote a thank you letter home. A happy new year to you all, my dearest family. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed your Christmas bundle. I just hugged it when it arrived. Oh. <laughs> then I sat down on the floor and read and looked and ate and laughed and cried. <gasps> the things you sent were just what I wanted. As she concludes, I had a very happy Christmas and new year, and I feel I'm getting on a little. I'm cheerful all the time now, work with a will, and take more interest in other people than I used to. Oh. Professor Bear has also offered to teach me German. As I said, one of my resolutions was to learn a language. Bless you all. Ever your loving Joe. Oh. 
I hope she is finding time to write with all the adventures she is having and new friends she is making. I value the professor's esteem and want to be worthy of his friendship. He is an excellent teacher. My German has actually started to improve. I am truly happy, and my pen lays idle. And for the first time in many years, I didn't mind. You know Das? Hans Christian Andersen, yes. Yeah, good. So, uh, you read from here. <coughs> das wäre einen... Das wär ein Frau für mich dacht er, aber sie ist... Etwas... Etwas... Vornehm. Vornehm. Das ist gut. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pleasant winter, and a long one, for I didn't leave Mrs. Kirk's until June. Everyone seems quite sorry to see me going. Going home. Ah, you are happy that you have a home to go in. You won't forget to come and see us if you ever travel our way, will you? I so want my family to know my friend. Do you? Shall I come? Please do. I'd like that very much. Mr. Bear came with me to the station to see me off. And thanks to him, I began my solitary journey with the pleasant memory of a familiar face smiling its farewell, a bunch of violets, and the happy thought that though I've written no books, earned no fortune, I've made a friend worth having, and I'll try and keep him all my life. I enjoyed my adventure in New York immensely, but now I was home, I was struck with the change in Beth. No one spoke of it or seemed aware of it, and Beth seemed happy, but a heavy weight fell on my heart as I looked into my sister's face. It was paler, thinner, and there was a strange, transparent look about it, as if mortal life was leaving her. Now, Beth, I have saved quite a bit, and I suggest a trip to the mountains. The air will do you the world of good. Oh, Joe, thank you with all my heart. But I'd rather not go so far from home. Do you mind if we just did a little visit to the seashore? I feel it would suit me much better. Of course. Whatever you need. Oh, but you have saved so, and my plans... I'm sorry to disrupt them. I want what's best for you, dear Beth. So to the quiet seashore we went, where Beth could sit in the open air and let the fresh sea breezes blow a little color into her pale cheeks, her hands too feeble to hold even the rosy shells we gathered. We were always together, as if we instinctively knew that a long separation was not far away. I'm glad you know it. I've tried to tell you, but I couldn't. As I've known for some time, and I'm used to it now. It would have been selfish to frighten you all with Amy away, and... Marmy tied up with Meg and her children and you so happy with Laurie. At least, I thought so then. I don't care of what becomes of anybody but you, Beth. You must get well. Oh, I want to oh, so much. I try, but every day I lose a little and I feel more sure that I shall never gain it back. <laughs> it's like the tide, Joe. When it turns, it goes slowly, but it can't be stopped. It shall be stopped. Nineteen is too oh. young. Beth, I can't let you go. I'll work and pray and fight against it. I'll keep you in spite of everything. There must be ways. It can't be too late. <laughs> I'm sorry to cry so. Do not be sorry, Cho. You'll tell them when we go home? I think they will see it without words. Perhaps not. I've heard that people who love you best are often blinded to such things. And if they do not see it, you will tell them for me. I don't want any secrets. It's kinder to prepare them. If I can. But, Beth, don't give up yet. Well, I don't know how to express myself and shouldn't try to anyone but you. Because I can't speak out except to my old Joe. I only mean to say that I have a feeling that it never was intended I should live long. Oh, I'm not like the rest of you. I, I never made plans about what I'd do when I grew up. I never thought of being married as you all did. I never wanted to go away, and 
The hard part now is the leaving you all. No, I'm not afraid, but it seems as if I should be homesick for you even in heaven. Oh, dear little bird, see Joe. Oh, oh, how tame it is. Oh, I like pigs better than gulls. They're not so wild and handsome, but they seem happy. Mother says they remind her of me. Busy creatures always near the shore, chirping that contented little song of theirs. You are the gull, Joe, strong and wild, <laughs> fond of the storm and the wind, flying far out to sea and happy all alone. Meg is the turtle dove, and Amy, the dear little girl, is the lark, trying to get up, up, up amongst the clouds, but always dropping down to the nest again. Oh, I hope I shall see her again. But she seems so far away. She is coming home in the spring, and I mean that you shall be all ready to see and enjoy her. I'm going to have you well and rosy by that time. Dear Joe, don't hope anymore. It won't do any good. I'm, I'm sure of that. But we won't be miserable. But enjoy being together while we wait. We'll have happy times, for I don't suffer much. And I think the tide will go out easily. If you help me. I will. I knew then I was losing my dear Bethy for good. And I vowed I would not break my promise to her. I had spent the morning hunting down Amy March. I went to her hotel, but found she was out for a walk, so took myself to the Promenade des Anglais. And who should I see strolling along without a care, as if she had lived here all her life, but the youngest of the March sisters? All grown up. Amy March? Is that you? Is that really you? <laughs> Dear Lori, <laughs> I didn't think Nice could get any more wonderful. Oh, what a pleasant surprise. How are you? Much better now, thank you. I have so much to say, and I don't know where to begin. Will you join me? I'd be delighted. <sighs> we walked together to Castle Hill to feed the peacocks. I watched Lori. He was handsomer than ever and greatly improved. But he looked tired and spiritless, and I felt a new sort of shyness steal over me. Mother writes to me and says Beth is very poorly. I, I think I ought to go home, but they all say stay, so I do, for I shall never have another chance like this. And they are right. You must stay. And I will keep you company. <laughs> Lori remained in Nice for a month. We took comfort in each other's society, but there's a hard, bitter look in Lori's face, full of pain, dissatisfaction, and regret. I couldn't find the merry-faced boy I left in the moody-looking man beside me. Lori, when are you going to your grandfather? Uh, soon. You've been saying that daily for the last two weeks. <laughs> are you bored of my company now? I just think you should do what's best. <laughs> what's best? <laughs> now, I have a new name for you. Lazy Lawrence. How do you like it? Not bad, thank you. Do you want to know what I honestly think of you? Pining to be told. I despise you. Oh, why, if you please? Because with every chance for being good, useful, and happy, you are faulty, lazy, and miserable. Strong language, mademoiselle. What would Joe say if she saw you now? As usual, go away, Teddy. I'm busy. Here you've been abroad nearly six months and done nothing but waste time and money and disappoint your friends. You know, I said when we first met that you'd improved. But now I take it all back. For I don't think you half so nice as when I left you at home. Do you think Joe would despise me as you do? Yes, if she saw you now. She hates lazy people. Why don't you do something splendid and make her love you? I did my best. But it was no use. She won't love me. Love Joe all your days if you choose. But don't let it spoil you. For it is wicked to throw away so many good gifts because you can't have the one you want. <sighs> there. I won't lecture anymore. For I know you'll wake up and be a man in spite of what has happened. Next morning, instead of the usual call, I received a note from Lori saying that Lazy Lawrence has returned to his grandpa like the best of boys. I'm glad he's gone, but I shall miss him. Amy took our advice and stayed in Europe. 
There was nothing she could do for Beth now, and there was no need of any words when we got home from the seashore, for father and mother saw plainly how frail Beth had become. I helped her up the stairs and into bed, her frail hands clutching to me for support and comfort. I so enjoyed our trip away, Joe, but I'm so glad to be home. I'm glad you enjoyed it. There now, you rest. You will tell father and mother, won't you? I don't want secrets. But when I went back downstairs, I was spared the hard task of telling Beth's secret. Father stood, leaning his head against the mantelpiece, and did not turn as I came in. And mother stretched out her arms as if for help, and I went to comfort her without a word. When the first bitterness was over, we accepted the inevitable and tried to bear it cheerfully and help one another. We put away our grief and each did our part toward making the end a happy one for Beth. The pleasantest room in the house was set apart for her and in it was gathered everything that she most loved. Flowers, pictures, her piano, the little work table and her beloved cats. How beautiful this sunny room is. Makes me very happy indeed. I'm so glad. Demi and Daisy will be here in a little while, so you rest now. There. Do you have everything you need? Mm, I do. Thank you, Joe. But there then came the sad time when Beth said the needle was so heavy and she put it down forever. Those little hands, which were always busy making gifts and treasures for everyone about her, were now so thin and pale. Talking wearied her, faces troubled her, and pain claimed her for its own. Such heavy days, such long, long nights, such aching hearts and imploring prayers. And I never left her side. Are you sleeping? Not asleep, but happy, for I don't fear it any longer. I'm sure I shall be your Beth still, even when I am gone. And in the dark hour before the dawn, she quietly drew her last <laughs> breath, with no farewell, but one loving look and a sigh. When morning came, the fire was out, my place was empty, and the room was very still. Beth looked at peace. The pain in her face had gone at last. My dear Lori, I am sorry that I have not written in so long. Our little Bethy has left us. Marmy says she is at peace and is happy now, but I long for her still. You wrote and asked me if I would ever change my mind, but Lori, I'm sorry. I cannot and I will not. I never want to hear the word love again. Please be happy with someone else, but promise to always keep a corner of your heart for your loving sister, Jo. Take care of Amy for us. I fear she will need some friendly face to comfort and console her. The moment I read the letter, I packed my knapsack and left Germany for Switzerland to be with Amy. My heart was full of joy and sorrow, hope and suspense, for in that moment, I realized that Amy was the only woman in the world who could fill Joe's place and make me happy. And I needed to be with her, console her, and love her as soon as I could. Oh, Lori. Lori, you've come. I knew you would. Oh, I, I came the minute I heard. I've been so lonely and sad, and I've longed to see you. I wish I could say something to comfort you for the loss of dear little Beth, but I, I can only feel... You needn't say anything. Your presence alone comforts me. Beth is at peace, and I mustn't wish her back. But I dread the going home much as I long to see them all. Aunt Carol and Flo are so very kind, but you seem like one of the family, and it would be so comfortable to have you for a little while. I'm going to take care of you. So don't cry anymore, dear Amy. In spite of the new sorrow, it was a very happy time. 
You must be tired. <laughs> Rest a little and let me row. I'm not tired. <laughs> but you may take an oar if you like. Uh, there's room enough for both of us. <laughs> then I shall sit with you and we can row together. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> okay. <sighs> You, you row well, Amy. I was thinking how well we pull together, don't we? Our oars are in time, and the boat glides so smoothly across the water. And I wish we might always pull in the same boat. Will you, Amy? Yes, Lori. I will. These are dark days. There is no one left now but me. Meg with her family, Amy enjoying her life abroad, and Beth gone and at peace. I find it very hard to keep the promises I made to Beth. How can I comfort mother and father when my own heart aches with a ceaseless longing for my dear sister? I can't do it, Marmy. I wasn't meant for a life like this. Dear Joe, why don't you write? That always used to make you happy. I've no heart to write. And if I had, nobody cares for my things. We do. Try it, dear. I'm sure it would do you good and please us very much. I don't believe I can. Despite my reservations, I went to my little desk and began to overhaul my half-finished manuscripts. I never knew how it happened, but Marmy was right. And I sat, scratching away, fully absorbed in my work. I wrote a little story, but it seemed to touch people's hearts. Mother and father and Meg laughed and cried over it when they read it, and then father insisted, very much against my will, to send it to a magazine. And to my complete surprise, it was not only paid for and printed, but other stories requested. I don't understand it. What can there be in a simple little story like that to make people praise it so? There's much truth in it, Jill. That's the secret. Humor and pathos make it alive, and you have found your style at last. You wrote with no thought of fame or money, and put your heart into it, my daughter. You have had the bitter. Now comes the sweet. I was more touched by my father's words than by any amounts of praise from the world. Newspapers copied the story, and strangers as well as friends admired it some writing to tell me so. We received more news in the mail. Amy and Lori wrote of their engagement. I took it very quietly and read the letter twice. Do you like the news from Lori and Amy, Marmy? Yes, I hoped it would be so. But my dear, I'm concerned for you. Does it pain you to learn your Teddy loves someone else? Do you really think I'm that silly and selfish that after refusing his love when it was freshest, if not best, I'd want it now. I knew you were sincere then. But lately, I have thought that if he came back and asked you again, you might perhaps feel like giving another answer. No, Mommy. It is better as it is. I am glad Amy has learned to love him. But you are right in one thing. I am lonely. And perhaps if Teddy had tried again, I might have said yes. Rest assured, dear Joe, he still loves you. But that love has changed. And now I hope you will be brother and sister and greater friends for all your days. How wise my mother is. How sharp her eyes. I can hide nothing from her, and I'm grateful to have her as my confidant. I often sit with Meg and sew and talk. Marriage is an excellent thing, then. I wonder if I should blossom out half as well as you have, if I ever tried it. <laughs> it's just what you need to bring out the tender, womanly half of your nature, Joe. You are a chestnut burr, prickly outside, but silky soft within, <laughs> and a sweet kernel, if only one can get at it. Love will make you show your heart someday, and then the burr will fall off. <sighs> Frost opens chestnut burrs, ma'am and it takes a good shake to bring them down. Boys go nutting, and I don't care to be bagged by them. <laughs> oh, that's my Joe. Nice to see some of that old spirit return. <laughs> I wondered where it had gone. 
But at home, alone and on rainy days when I could not walk, the old feeling came back again, a restless spirit within me. These feelings woke within me, a hungry longing for someone to love and cling to with heart and soul. Alone in the twilight, lying on the old sofa, looking at the fire and thinking, I have Beth's little red pillow with me, and I'll lie here, planning stories, dreaming dreams, and thinking tender thoughts of my sister, who never seems far away. Although I am sad, tomorrow is my birthday. How fast the years are going by, and how old I am getting, and how little I seem to have accomplished. Almost 25, and nothing to show for it. But then, I see a friendly, familiar person coming up the path towards the house, and suddenly sunshine pours in. Hello? Anyone home? Oh, my Teddy! Oh, Teddy! <laughs> Dear Joe, you are glad to see me, then. Glad? My blessed boy words cannot express my gladness. Where's Amy? Your mother's got her. Down in Mags, we stopped there by the way, and there was no getting my wife out of their clutches. You're what? Oh, the Dickens, now I've done it. You've gone and gotten married. Yes, <laughs> don't I look like a married man and head of a family? <laughs> Not a bit, and you never will. You are the same old Teddy as ever. <laughs> oh, how good it sounds to hear you say Teddy. No one calls me that but you. So tell me how it happened, when, where, how? Six weeks ago at the American Consuls at Paris. A very quiet wedding, of course. Or even in our happiness, we didn't forget dear little Beth. Why didn't you let us know afterwards? We wanted to surprise you. Well, you certainly did that. Joe, dear, I, I want to say one thing, and then we will put it by forever. I shall never stop loving you. But the love has altered, and I have learned to see that it is better as it is. Amy and you changed places in my heart, that's all. I think it was meant to be so, and would have come about naturally if I had waited as you tried to make me. But, but I could never be patient, and so I got heartache. Can we go back to the happy old times when we first knew one another? Teddy, we never can be boy and girl again. The happy times can't come back, and we mustn't expect it. I shall miss my boy, but I shall love the man just as much and admire him more, because he means to be what I hoped he would. He says not a word, but takes the hand I offer him and lays his face down on it for a minute, and out of the grave of a boyish passion... There rises a beautiful, strong friendship to bless us both. Then in come the whole family, and everyone was hugged and kissed. Where is she? Where is my dear old Joe? Here I am. <laughs> Look at little Amy in all her glory. She is quite the Parisian. How well they look together. <laughs> An old maid. That's what I'm to be. A literary spinster with a pen for a spouse. A family of stories for children, and 20 years hence, a morsel of fame, perhaps. I'll weep a little weep when I go to bed. It won't do to be dismal now. I drew my hand over my eyes and had just managed to smile when there was a knock at the door. I answered with hospitable haste and stared as if a ghost had come to surprise me. For there stood a stout bearded gentleman beaming at me from the darkness. Oh, Mr. Bear! I am so glad to see you. And I to see Miss March. But, no, you have a party. No, we haven't. Only the family. My brother and sister have just come home. Come in and join us. Father? Mother? This is my friend. Professor Bear. Professor, a warm welcome to you. We've heard a great deal about you. Oh, thank you. Oh, Very uh, nice to meet you. Everyone greeted him kindly, and they seemed to warm to him at once. For a fortnight, Mr. Bear came and went with lover-like regularity, and no one ever asked about the change in me. Why I sung about my work, did my hair three times a day, or was so blooming when I returned from my evening exercise. Dearest Joe... I have nothing but much love to give you. I came to see if you could care for it. Can you make a little place in your heart for old Fritz? Oh, yes. Dear Friedrich, 
Why didn't you tell me any of this sooner? Well, I, I, ha I had a wish to tell something the day I said goodbye to you in New York. But I thought you were betrothed to Laurie. Would you have said yes if I had spoken? I'm afraid not, for I didn't have any heart just then. The new year began rather soberly, for Aunt March died suddenly. But when our sorrow was over, for despite her sharp tongue, we all loved the old lady, we found a cause for rejoicing. For Aunt March had left Plumfield to me, which made all sorts of joyful things possible. This is a fine old place. And we'll bring a handsome sum, for of course you intend to sell it. No, I don't. <laughs> you don't mean to live here. Yes, I do. But my dear girl, it's an immense house, and we'll take a power of money to keep in order. The garden and orchard alone need two or three men, and farming isn't in Bear's line, I take it. I want to open a school for little lads. A good, happy, home-like school with me to take care of them, and Fritz to teach them. I told my plan to Fritz, and he said it was just what he would like, and agreed to try it when we got rich. But now, thanks to my good old aunt, who loved me better than I deserved, I'm rich. At least, I feel so. And we can live at Plumfield perfectly well if we have a flourishing school. I've always longed for lots of boys, and now I can fill the house full. Think what luxury! Plumfield, my own and a wilderness of boys to enjoy it with me. But may I inquire how you intend to support this establishment if the pupils are little ragamuffins? I'm afraid your crop won't be profitable in a worldly sense. Now don't be a wet blanket, Teddy. Of course I shall have rich pupils. Rich people's children often need care and comfort as well as poor. We had a modest wedding with the family and closest friends. A day I never thought I would have. <laughs> Of course, we were not all here, but Beth still seemed among us, a peaceful presence, and I could hear her say, Be happy, I am here. Are you happy, Mrs. Bear? I am, very much, my dear Fritz. That is so good. Music to my ears, my love. <laughs> Almost before I knew where I was, I found myself married and settled at Plumfield. A family of seven boys sprung up like mushrooms and flourished surprisingly. How I enjoyed my wilderness of boys, and how poor dear Aunt March would have lamented had she been there to see the sacred precincts of prim, well-ordered Plumfield overrun with boys. Every room in the big house was soon full. Every little plot in the garden had an owner. And three times a day, I smiled at my Fritz from the head of a long table lined on either side with rows of happy young faces. Two little boys of my own arrived to increase my happiness. Rob, named after Grandpa, and Teddy, a happy-go-lucky baby who inherited his Papa's sunshine temper and his mother's lively spirit. Many family holidays were spent at Plumfield when all the family would flock to the great house for laughter and songs and apple picking and feasting. Oh, there never has been such a perfect day as this. Or such a jolly set to enjoy it. <laughs> Dear fellows, it does my heart good to see them forget business and work and frolic for the day. <laughs> our girls are all grown up. Just you and I left in our little house now. How good it is to see them so happy. Though I miss dear Beth more each day. She would want you to be happy for them, for I know she is. My dear girls, our little women, I never could wish them a greater happiness than all of this. <laughs> <laughs>